So welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon on the future of universities. The theme is the context of changing society, academic student relationships, creativity and global social challenges. So my name is Ed Fay. I'm the university librarian at the University of Bristol. And we're really pleased to be joined this afternoon uh, by a number of expert speakers. So we have Josie McClellan, who is Professor of History at the University of Bristol. Josie is a social and cultural historian with particular research interests in public history and the co-production of research with people outside the university. We have Ankish Fitai, Professor of Anthropology and Global Development at the University of Sussex. Jenny Bristow, Senior Lecturer in Sociology at Canterbury Christchurch University and Julia Mortimer, Journals and Open Access Director at the uh, Bristol University Press. So please type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will put them to the panellists in the second half of our session this afternoon. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat and someone will be able to help you. We have closed captions enabled on the webinar and there's a, bottom at the, a button at the bottom of your screen, uh, CC Live Transcript, I believe. Uh, so please use this to show or hide text as you prefer. And there are details on how to order our author's books at a discount uh, in the chat. I believe I've seen that already and uh, we will certainly remind you later. So our theme today is considering the futures of universities, which uh, seems very timely, both as we emerge from COVID, but also considering the wider context and longer term developments in the sector, right across our missions of research, education, and increasingly, of course, civic and social responsibility. And in each of these areas, we have, I think we can all recognise a turbulent environment in terms of government policy, national discourse, but also our learnings of, of, about it, uh, equity and inclusion through COVID and beyond. So in research, we have a recognition from governments about the role that universities can play in innovation and in post-COVID recovery, uh, the building back better policy soundbite, uh, and also increased funding uh, confirmed in the most recent spending review backing this up. Uh, and this is addressing both global, but also importantly, local challenges and partnerships uh, around levelling up uh, and the government's priorities uh, nationally within the UK. In education, we have a pandemic which has forced a move to more blended learning in many ways. In some ways, that's accelerated some of the changes that we're seeing around flexibility, around personalization, inclusivity and diversity for different learning styles. But there's also, in many areas, highlighted the limits of our current pedagogical practice and, and these deep social issues of inclusion and equity, both in terms of who gets access to education, but also within our communities where some of our naive assumptions of, of equity and privilege have been challenged, all bound up in issues about how we build uh, communities and the, the kind of national policy and government policy around student fees and loans and interplay with lifelong learning, the skills agenda um, in steering some of our educational priorities. And then finally, the, the social and civic context of all of this, considering everything from the ways in which universities impact global challenges. We have COP26 ongoing right now, but also the local in terms of widening participation and skills and lifelong learning, both at a time when the policy is in flux, but also the media agenda within the UK is, is not always helpful and, and is sometimes sort of critical bordering on hostile. So both the government recognising the importance of universities in research and supporting social uh, development and social inclusion, uh, but at the same time, a somewhat divergent view um, around say the culture wars and freedom of speech uh, and sort of universities are something to be suspicious of. So some really interesting tensions uh, at play in the sector at the moment. Um, and into this environment come our speakers who will speak to many of these themes and help us navigate and, and imagine some of these futures. So please do consider your questions as we go. Please do enter questions into the chat and hopefully we can have something of a lively debate this afternoon. So I will hand over now to Josie McClellan, co-author of Who Universities Are For. Josie will focus on how universities of the future might be more flexible, considering whether concentrating all of one's higher education into three full-time years needs rethinking as the pace of technological and social change accelerates and most people have longer working lives. So over to you, Josie. Thanks so much, Ed. And I'm just going to share a couple of slides. Um, so it's really nice to be here this evening. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today 
are um, very much coming out of a book um, that I wrote with two of my colleagues, Tom Sperlinger and Richard Pettigrew. And in writing this book, we were drawing on our experiences, um, setting up and teaching on the Arts Foundation Year at the University of Bristol which was a programme that was that we set up um, for people without um, A-level qualifications as a, a one year route into university. And as we were teaching on that programme and working with the fantastic students that came on and studied with us, um, we started to have a lot of thoughts about how some of the things that were happening in miniature on this programme um, could actually change the whole higher education landscape for the better. Um, and what I want to do in, um, in the time that I've got is just pull out um, three of our ideas that I think seem particularly pertinent in the light of the issues that Ed has raised and, um, and in the post-pandemic landscape. So the first one um, relates to the way that we admit people to university and our admittedly rather bold proposal was to uh, abolish admissions criteria completely. Our experience working with the foundation year students, none of whom had A levels or an equivalent qualification, um, were that they were engaged, lively and with some um, some support, absolutely able to thrive academically. And many of those first cohort of students have gone on to get first class degrees and gone on to, to further study. Um, I think we all know, and there's lots of research that shows that A-levels are not a particularly good indicator of the ability to, um, to excel at university. Um, and I think we also all know that our current system of using A-levels for university um, admission is really problematic in a lot of ways. Um, it exacerbates social inequality and some of the issues of access to university education. Um, it entrenches hierarchies amongst universities in a way that is becoming increasingly problematic, um, particularly since the lifting of the cap on tuition fees and the inclusion of data on um, A-level um, A level grades in university league tables. Um, and it distorts our entire secondary um, education system um, and makes the focus um, far too much on um, exam performance in a way that, as we saw during the pandemic, um, is both socially really divisive and puts a huge amount of pressure on young people. Um, so our solution is simply to have open admission to university supplemented by, um, by interviews um, where necessary and, um, and then to allow people to, um, to participate in the university system without, without this A-level barrier. The second proposal um, is to make all higher education um, part-time and lifelong. Um, our sense is that concentrating all of one's higher education in three years, aged 18 to 21, um, makes increasingly little sense and doesn't fit well with the world that we now live in. Um, we're all living longer, we're experiencing rapid technological, so social and environmental change that means people need to reskill throughout their lives. Um, and it also feels like making higher education an all or nothing decision at a very um, pivotal point in young people's lives um, is exacerbating the pressures on young people and a lot of the mental health problems that we're seeing amongst adolescents and amongst students. Um, so our idea is to get rid of the artificial end point of a degree and to allow people to study as and when they need to and want to throughout their lifetimes um, and to encourage people rather than doing that full time and cramming it into a small space of time um, encourage people to do it alongside paid work volunteering and caring responsibilities um, and our sense is that that would allow people um, more 
time and space to absorb their learning from higher education. And it would also make higher education more flexible, make it a better fit with the shape of people's lives. Crucially, I think it would also make our student bodies more diverse, not just in terms of age, but also in terms of life experience, social background um, and ethnicity, which I think would create a much more lively learning environment in universities. One of the things we found on the foundation year was our colleagues who came in to lead a session would often remark on what an amazing experience it was um, because of the, the diversity in the classroom and the liveliness of the discussions and all of the different perspectives that students were able to bring to the subject material. And my final um, idea um, that I wanted to, to bring to the discussion today um, was making universities more porous and more connected with the communities that they sit in. Um, and I think partly this would happen naturally as a result of making all higher education lifelong. People would be more, um, more liable to use their local universities um, and they would be using dipping in and out of higher education throughout their lives. Um, and I think this would make universities a lot more embedded in and part of their local ecosystems. Um, and one of the things that we explored in the book was the idea of getting communities involved in setting priorities for their local universities, including allocating a certain amount of funding for teaching and research, and hopefully um, making less of uh, breaking down some of the boundaries and divisions between academia and the wider world. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks, Josie. Some some really powerful uh, kind of pr proposals and provocations, perhaps, um, for us to consider in, in our discussions. So next is Anka Schwitai, author of Creative Universities. Anka will speak about how universities of the future can better combine critical and creative teaching to help students better understand global challenges, but also imagine alternative responses to them. So over to you, Anka. Thank you, Ed, and I just want to um, thank the organizers for having me on this panel and also welcome to the audience uh, from the chat. I can see it's quite an international audience, so it's really nice to have you all. So um, I'm Anka and I recently um, published a book with Bristol called Creative Universities Reimagining Education for Global Challenges and Alternative Futures. And in this book, I argue uh, that universities going forward need to be become better at combining critical creative teaching. Now, given my own background in anthropology and international development, I focus in particularly on the social sciences, where, for example, in international development, we are really good at teaching students kind of critical thinking skills to have them um, to question them, to get them to question the, the colonial legacies, the systems of power and the ongoing inequalities that shape the international development industry. And this, is, this critical teaching is crucially important to help students better understand the complexities, the contradictions, and the many limitations of mainstream interventions that aim to solve global challenges. And students, for the most part, really appreciate and, and understand this critical teaching. But I think a teaching that only focuses on that can leave students quite cynical and demoralized. At least that's been my experience in my teaching. And this is where I think creative teaching has a really important role to play to help students imagine alternative responses to these global challenges and to explore their own roles in working towards these. And by alternative, I explicitly mean kind of non-mainstream heterodox responses. And in, in my book, I present a lot of examples to address social, economic and ecological challenges and also how these could be taught in critical creative ways. So I think I want to give you a really concrete example. On Thursday, it's a Cities and Communities Day at COP26. Now, this term, I teach a third year specialist option on urban futures. And on Friday in my seminar, I'm of course gonna talk with my students about the ideas and, and measures and proposals that have been put forward um, in Glasgow and whether they go far enough we will critically interrogate whether they will far enough given everything we've learned in the course so far. 
But in order to encourage students to think more creatively about um, urban ecological challenges, uh, we will also explore what these measures might mean for Brighton, which is where all of my students live. The University of Sussex is really, re really close to Brighton. And this focus on Brighton has been something that we've had throughout the module um, and which builds really strongly on kind of students own experiential knowledge of Brighton residents. So they start the term by keeping a Brighton diary to become more aware of their own kind of lives in Brighton. And then they collectively write a Brighton manifesto to think how to make the city more, more equitable and sustainable. And further on, we will be building scenarios to kind of give material shape to these ideas. And we are also planning a field trip at the moment to explore issues of urban waste. Um, those of you in the UK might know that there recently was a, a waste collector strike in Brighton, <laughs> which made things really unpleasant for um, a couple of weeks. So for me, um, this is kind of what I mean by critical creative teaching. I think of it as learning by doing um, that makes students co-producers of knowledge by drawing on their own kind of really embodied um, experiences, in this case of Brighton residents. Um, critical creative teaching uses creative methods from the arts or design, in this case with scenario building, that develops a kind of their creative capacities, their empathy, their, their being comfortable with ambiguity. And it also connects theory and practice, and this idea of praxis is, is really important as well as um, last but not least, fostering students' critical hope. Um, by critical hope, I don't mean kind of wishful or naive um, thinking around you know, what could happen, but a hope that is, that is really active and that is very reparative in being aware of kind of past um, injustices and current inequalities. But it is also forward-looking in terms of asking how can you know, students work towards um, addressing the situation. So I think this is just one example of how I think future universities can help students better understand global challenges um, through developing kind of the necessary knowledges and capabilities and orientations, but, and also then help them imagine alternative responses to them. Now, I just want to finish. I'm sometimes asked, you know, where is the space for this kind of teaching? given the current situation in universities, you know, um, many staff are already completely overworked and stretched their limits. Students are really anxious about their education and kind of what comes after. And we are all laboring under the real um, structural constraints of the neoliberal higher education context. And I know um, other panelists will be addressing this. Um, and in the face of these conditions, I think of um, Bell Hooks's observation that the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. And I think of Boaventura de Sousa Santos, who called for teaching revolutionary ideas in reactionary institutions. I draw inspiration from Paolo Freire's writings and from um, J.K. Gibson Graham's proposal to become academic subjects of possibilities. And I think inspired by all of these scholars and many others, um, I personally really believe kind of in finding the cracks, the cracks and openings in university systems, you know, however small they might be, and to start working then, and then to link up with like-minded colleagues and students, because they do exist, and to grow these spaces into viable alternatives. And it's hard work, and it takes um, a lot of courage and perseverance, uh, but I think it's well worth it. Thank you. Great, thanks Anka. Already some really interesting themes emerging here about kind of diversity and, and why this is good, not only for inclusion for people kind of participating in ways that they maybe have been excluded before, but also how that benefits this whole endeavour of creativity in, in teaching and in research and knowledge creation. But also these tensions emerging between kind of what is radicalism, what is a government agenda, uh, what is a kind of perception of, of kind of orthodox and, and how is that perceived more widely. So, so uh, um, please do keep sending your questions in there are a number um, appearing uh, already which is great I'll, I'll be coming to those at the end so uh, over now to Jenny Bristow who is co-author of generational encounters with higher education Jenny will discuss different generational experiences and expectations of university focusing on the enduring importance of the academic student relationship uh, asking can we acknowledge the central importance of academic staff at the same time as promoting students as consumers of a wider experience. So over to Jenny. Thank you Ed and, and thanks to everyone for coming to this. Um, 
I actually, when considering the future of universities, I wanted to start with a quote from someone else's book. Uh, this is Neil Postman, an American writer, writing in 1996 in a book that was provocatively titled The End of Education. And Postman wrote, I write this book in the hope of offering, uh, sorry, altering a little bit, the definition of the school problem from means to ends. End, of course, has at least two important meanings, purpose and finish. Either meaning may apply to the future of schools, depending on whether or not there ensues a serious dialogue about purpose. By giving the book its ambiguous title, I mean to suggest that without a transcendent and honourable purpose, schooling must reach its finish, and the sooner we are done with it, the better. With such a, with such a purpose, schooling becomes the central institution through which the young might, may find reasons for continuing to educate themselves. And I think if we apply that to the current discussions of, of universities, it is quite apposite. I think the, um, the modern university, and I'm you know, focusing on the UK here, but it's obviously in an international context, has become really quite unsure about its purpose. I think if we regain this purpose of the university um, as institutions based on a sense of professional autonomy dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, then we can think of universities as having a much needed future. But if not, I think they will struggle. And then we might want to ask questions about what do we mean by universities and really should they exist at all? Um, so I been, was thinking about this, this kind of question with my colleagues when we wrote our book, I'll wave this one, <laughs> Generational Encounters with Higher Education, um, the uh, academic student relationship and the university experience. This was a book that was based on research conducted before the pandemic, and in fact, the book was published just as the pandemic broke in Britain, uh, which was kind of, you know, a bit of a shame because we had to cancel our launch event, et cetera. Um, but I think we've been thinking about that subsequently to, to the findings that we um, had in the study and presented in the book, and then how we reflect on them, you know, sort of 18 months on after going through the, the pandemic experience. In the book, we talked about and considered the changing meaning of higher education for uh, different generations going through uh, university from um, essentially from the 1960s onwards, from the 1963 uh, Robbins report. And we outlined two major changes that seem to have happened in the, um, in the university. One is the role accorded to students. So students have gone from being considered as a kind of expanded, but still quite small meritocratic elite um, who were at university to acquire knowledge and take society forwards. I mean, that was really the, the Robbins ideal to now how they're presented as sort of very individual consumers of higher education experiences from which they themselves expect to benefit and which of course also they are expected to pay. At the same time, we've seen a reconfiguration of the role of the academic. Uh, we noted the curious disappearance in policy documents of discussions about the academic. Uh, Robbins talked about them quite a lot. Recent policy talk, documents talk about them um, barely at all. And you have a sense that the academic has gone from being considered central to the role of the university to more like um, almost a functionary in this kind of wider project. Uh, where academics are often expected to play the role of whether it's a sort of a school teacher, um, a counsellor or a promoter of particular value set, a developer of employability skills, the producer of student satisfaction. Those of us who work in universities know that we're under these pressures all the time to fulfil these, these roles, which are really quite different to those of a professional educate, educator. And one effect of this has been to make the academic student relationship thinner in the sense of a thinner tie, um, and often quite defensive. Um, universities have often kind of been presented and, and sort of understood as a consumer experience at the expense of the wider academic com community. So thinking about that in relation to the time before COVID and the, the time before now, I think that the past 18 months has been quite instructive and certainly thought provoking. The university experience as it's marketed with all the buildings and excitement and this, that and the other has all but disappeared. I mean, students weren't, weren't there. And uh, this has been, I think, very difficult um, and unsatisfying time for students. 
Um, they've been thrust into a highly individualized and often quite alienating experience of online learning. There's been no kind of physical academic community around them. On the other hand, it's not all been bad in a sense. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of taught academics and students to kind of reconsider a bit about what the purpose of university is. The academic student relationship over the past 18 months has been pushed much more to the fore because we're the only ones there. And we have been in this direct uh, relationship with students. I may have focused students on actually what they want out of being at university um, in terms of you know, the learning, the studying, and that kind of central kind of role of, of the academic pursuit um, of, of the university. It's also raised questions about whether the university should be considered you know, the next step from school, uh, which is something that came out very powerfully in our study, that it's just a sort of, students often experience it as something that they're expected to do. Um, so I, I think, I mean, what I'm interested in now is, is the, the balance. I think that there's been a lot of problems um, over the past 18 months with uh, sort of showing the role that uh, universities have played, that in the absence of there being this sense of a, uh, an academic community, universities have sort of been holding operations for young people. Um, there's been quite a schoolified approach to the academic student relationship. You're talking directly to the student is quite didactic, didactic, well, didactic. Um, you know, the students aren't really talking to each other in the same way they are in a, a seminar. Uh, tensions around technologization, you know, can the academic just be replaced by a video? I mean, this was a discussion before the pandemic and I think has become quite fraught now. On the other hand, I think there's a real potential opportunity within that experience to rediscover actually the purpose and the excitement of university as academic communities with people at their heart and the pursuit of knowledge as their purpose. And I, I certainly feel kind of quite positive that we can begin to have that conversation now as we start back. So just to conclude, if, if I may, um, the uh, uh, one of my other favorite quotes is from uh, Ritzer, uh, writing in 2002, as part of a contribution to um, a collection of essays on uh, the McDonaldization of the university. And I think in, in this essay, Ritzer puts very nicely the centrality of the academic role, where he says, actually, you know, universities are making a mistake by thinking they have to compete with shopping malls you know, maybe they need to be less consumerist, less glitzy. Um, and he says, while everything around it is growing increasingly McDonaldized, the route open to the university is to create spectacle by de-McDonaldizing its quotidian activities. Inefficient, unpredictable, incalculable education employing human technologies, that's us, <laughs> will seem quite spectacular to students, especially in contrast to the numbing McDonaldization that is found almost everywhere else. Thank you. So, so much we're going to be able to explore further here, isn't there, around kind of purpose and our values and, and where we find ourselves today. So tempting as it is to dive in as everyone talks, um, we'll now hand over to, to Julia. Julia is the Journals and Open Access Director at Bristol University Press. And Julia will look at how the university press fits with the mission of the university, supporting the way academia and teaching is changing and looking to aggress, address global social challenges. So over to you, Julia. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the university press's role um, and what I think the university press um, role is in, in terms of the future of universities and tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Bristol University Press, which is already um, addressing some of the things that we've discussed about. And then I'll talk about what I think the role is that we'll play in the future. Um, so in terms of the value of the university press, um, it, we're very much at the centre of the global knowledge ecosystem. So we've been talking a lot about um, teaching, but you know, there's um, a lot in terms of the research side. Um, that we haven't discussed so far. And I think university press is obviously at the very heart of that. They help extend the mission, influence and brand of the parent institution. Um, we publish work and perform services that are of vast benefit to the diverse scholarship, scholarly network. Um, and really crucially, there's that outreach role to a broad audience of readers and the larger world, which I'll talk about more in a minute. 
And crucially, the not-for-profit role that we play um, in contrast to um, other publishers um, that are available. Um, and we're guided by and united in, in, a, in our core values um, that define who we are and the goals to which we aspire. So just briefly about Bristol University Press, we um, were established um, as our imprint 20, uh, 25 years ago, Policy Press was established and Bristol University Press only five years ago. We're just celebrating our anniversary this year, um, but we have continued the aims and goals of Policy Press, which are very much about um, bringing about social change and we are increasingly, when we set up Bristol University Press, we realised that we're increasingly aligned with the University of Bristol goals. And we're embedded in the scholarship, scholarly community. We're set up really to, to, to tackle global social challenges. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And quality of service content and product is absolutely crucial to what we do, um, along with our outstanding order and customer care. And I think that's that's one thing that university presses the world over um, really are known for. So there's the um, impact beyond academia, which links with the themes that we've talked about already about real world impact and really pushing the scholarly boundaries and being a critical press in that respect. So just to show how that does align with Bristol University's priorities, um, they're listed there, obviously, research, innovation, partnerships, education, student experience, internationalization, um, being a model global civic university, impact and engagement, and the culture of diversity and inclusion, um, which you know, we need to push further all the time, being a beacon of environmental sustainability and addressing society's greatest challenges. So there are the current um, priorities for the university, which we link with. So the focus on global social challenges, we think is, is pretty unique to us at Bristol University Press. Obviously, many presses are working towards the um, SDG goals, but we want to continue to do that, that work around these themes um, beyond the range of the SDGs um, and out the other side. And this is at the core of everything that we do. And um, one example of our work in this area where we've um, we worked in partnership with the university is our new Global Social Challenges Journal. Um, it's a fully open access journal. Um, it focuses on interdisciplinary and co-produced research. So, so a, a real space to debate, and bring together a, a range of perspectives to tackle the global social challenges with a traditional and non-traditional output. So aiming to reach um, and engage a wide variety of audiences beyond as well as within academia. Working on those themes that I just displayed there, um, and these do map directly onto the SDGs, so we've got that link there. And we really want to make this uh, a different kind of journal, um, you know, really engaging with diverse and inclusive audiences. And we've got a wonderful board and editorial set team set up to do that already, which takes us, um, helps us fulfill on that mission. And it's based within the social sciences because that's that's the core of what we do at Bristol University Press. But we want to go broader than that and engage with research from humanities, arts, and STEM as well. And in all of that, you know, the the, the core, the essence of our publishing with the purpose mission is that it's accessible, impactful, and policy facing. So I think that's one example of what a university press and a university working together can achieve. And I just wanted to um, give a shout out really to our incredible marketing team at the press, because when we publish things, um, hopefully the authors um, today will agree, we don't just publish them and put them out there. We do everything we can to get to ensure that the messages break through, um, through media, through blogs, through podcasts, um, radio, television programs, etc. So. Yeah, really getting that message through and engaging with real life. And um, continuing that, 
one place to look for um, that accessible output um, for everything that we do is our Transforming Society blog, um, which again, the marketing team do a, do a brilliant job. And really it's, it's an example of how we take the um, academic research product as, as it were, and find a myriad of ways that we can translate that into making a difference in society. So thinking about the future, and, and I've just been thinking about you know, everything that um, people have been speaking about today. And I think the crucial role that we need to play is working with um, creative teaching and student resources to support that future curriculum, the kind of real life experience that Anka was talking about earlier. Um, and we have a really important role in supporting emerging and inter interdisciplinary areas, which may not be commercially profitable or you know, the, where there's a, a real need for presses to support those um, in, a, in a university press arena. The other area is coming up with flexible and innovative digital solutions. And I think that we've had some examples of that at the press during the pandemic. Um, the, the commissioning team and production team got together and very quickly came, came up with a new format, which were called rapid responses. And they were designed to get the latest research on the pandemic um, and what was happening out there in the world. And that there was a very quick turnaround of around 12 weeks, I think, in getting those out there. So that's just one example, but there are many. We're... Um, planning to work um, very more much more closely with uh, the library on open scholarship initiatives. And Ed and I have been talking about that already and uh, looking forward to further engagement. And we are also thinking about the ways in which the university is expanding its mission um, into different areas and, and different um, schools. And um, one example of that is um, you know, different kind of business school that's developing and where we can support that with products and, and teaching materials. And as I think, I hope you have been stressing already, co-production, participatory approaches and community engagement are absolutely vital um, in the way forward. So just some examples of things in the wider university press world. There's been um, many many new um, open access library based presses which have emerged in recent years and um, they are putting out some really interesting work and really supporting their institutions. There have been collaborations to co-produce exciting teaching resources and libraries have also been supporting open access via crowdsourcing and subscribe to open type initiatives and um, particularly working for not for with not-for-profit presses um, in a quite a challenging open access environment at the moment for smaller presses. So I think that's really um, just what I wanted to say and, and to support everything that's been, been said before about the way that the university is changing and that the university press is a really key partner to work with in trying to bring about some of those changes going forward. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Julia. Some really helpful perspectives uh, on, on how some of these debates can, can be sort of broadened and, and engage wider communities. And, and that's certainly a theme running right through everything we've spoken about today, isn't it, is diversity within our communities. How are we more inclusive, uh, both for the benefit of, of the kind of people who are uh, involved in higher education, but really kind of questions of what that, that means and some real tensions there perhaps between some of the sort of government and policy context and actually the values and, and the sort of the basis on which, um, you know, we're all drawn to that idea of knowledge production and sharing and, and, um, and inclusivity. But I'm also struck by the degree of creativity, you know, considering all of these challenges, uh, you know, hearing some really inspirational futures here um, and, and some real kind of commitment to exploring those. So a number of questions have started to come through. Um, a couple of them are, are for specific authors, but I'm going to go a little bit actually in reverse um, because the, the sort of most recent question that has come in, I think, is, is a really interesting challenge in this context. Um, uh, and um, our, our questioner says that they would like to know the opinion of our speakers. Are, are, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of universities? 
given everything that you've spoken on. So a very broad question. I don't know if anyone wants to dive into that one. Uh, it's not a soft open, I'm afraid. It's a, it's quite a big one. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic? What do you think? How will this play out? Um, I'll, I, I, can, I can be brave and dive in. Um, I think in a way I'm optimistic because I think there are so many fundamental problems with the university system as it's currently set up in the UK. And I think we really saw that during the pandemic. And personally, I was hoping that, you know, that, that the fact that universities kind of didn't have a great pandemic would crack open some of those problems and spark um, a bit of a, a bit of a debate and a, a chance to air some more radical solutions. Um, that that didn't happen. Um, you know, everyone's had a lot of other stuff on their minds. It's understandable. Um, but I don't think these problems, you know, that we all have been aware of for many years are, are going to go away and um i think that a time will come when there is a sort of big shake up and um you know hopefully when that shake up happens um what will replace our current systems will be um will, will be better than what we've currently got um so i i am optimistic in a, in a strange kind of way I'm sort of with JC there, actually, I think, um, you know, because I, I think that, that something has got to change. I think that's, that's the point and what really needs to happen. I think it's, you know, a, a lot of it is down to academics. I think we've got to grasp the nettle and ask ourselves, what are we for? What are we doing? What is it that we want from, you know, that, that role as an academic? You know, it's not just a job, is it? It's something that we go into because, you know, we, we feel it's important. And I don't think we've necessarily been that great at, at kind of articulating that um and i think certainly where i you know i agree with you jc is that i think the experience of of the pandemic has has unsettled a bit of the comfort blanket to universities you know that assumption that the 18 year, year olds will always come and that it should just be that and that this is all going to kind of um carry on um but i think it's going to be an uncomfortable few years but then I'm, you know, I am an optimist generally, so I would say I'm optimistic, but I don't think it's going to be easy. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that, same here. I'm, I am optimistic, I'm very much agreeing with, with Josie of Jenny about the need for change, but also there's actually a lot of stuff already happening um, and it's kind of flying under the radar screen. And um, I talked about kind of, you know, kind of the cracks in the system that do exist and I did, about three years of research talking to lots of colleagues and students and just hearing from them and what they're doing and thinking. And I think, you know, connecting that and, 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 and growing it, I think there is, um, yeah, there's, there's a good future ahead, not without challenges, but I'm, I'm optimistic as well. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I think, you know, the fantastic response we get to the work that we publish at the press and the fact that it is challenging the status quo um, and providing critical responses means that there is a, you know, there is a way forward, I think. Um, I'm not on the teaching and, and academic side, but I think I, I certainly would hope that there's a role for universities and university presses to carry on in the future. So we're all agreed. Fantastic. That's a good starting point, isn't it? It's clear that some of these changes are going to happen, like it or not. It's how we respond, isn't it? And that idea of articulating what we're for is something which is very much kind of current at Bristol at the moment in our university strategy refresh. Quite often hear people say, well, we're, 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 not, we're sort of reasonably good at saying what we're good at, but not necessarily what we're good for. And that's a really interesting challenge. Um, Another question uh, which came in, which was a bit more focused, but I think is, is relevant actually to, to kind of each of your positions on this, which is about how we get there. So if we see these futures, we see these tensions, we see the churn and we're all optimistic about the future. What from your perspectives will help us get there? How do we navigate this? Can I say, I mean, I, there's a massive debate going on at the moment about academic freedom and freedom of speech. And this is something that I think Oh, have we, has Jenny frozen? Yeah, Jenny's frozen mid-sentence. 
and oh sorry, no Jenny you back sorry we, we lost you for a second you, could you start again please? yeah sorry I, I, I cut out can you hear me now yeah yes sorry um I think we do sometimes get caught up in in this this kind of idea of oh it's all just sort of impossible and we're under all of these pressures which we are you know um but I think sometimes we we underestimate what we can do I mean because we are a community and we do have students there and and we do have you know, massive resources. I mean, I think the university press is brilliant. I, yeah, I think BUP is brilliant. I think the library resources we get now and the access and all of this, you know, so I'm not anti-technology. I think we can make great use of it. Um, so I, I think just kind of recognizing that, um, yeah, we're dealing with a whole number of pressures that are out of our control. But one thing we can control is to say, well, you know, what is the purpose of a university if we can't explore ideas in an open way? For example, if we can't have the freedom to explore things as knowledge um, and to really kind of push that case. Um, one of the things I would say is that we need to take students along the journey um, in terms of kind of vision of future universities and make sure they are they understand this, they're on board. So uh, there's a lot of thinking around kind of co-ownership and, and co-production of learning. And for me, that's something that's that's really important, a really important part of this. Absolutely. And, and actually there was a, a specific question for you, Anka, about some of your design process. And, and um, one, one of our audience was interested to whether you had maybe some concrete examples of, of how you used this in your, your own work. Yes. So for me, um, both kind of design and the arts are a really um, two really important areas where we can go to think of some concrete creative um, concepts and, and methods and practices. So design specifically, for example, the, the idea of wicked problems, which is a, a, um, something that was first developed um, within a design studies is, is a really, for me, a really productive way to think about global challenges because it really unpacks their, their interlink, their complex um, character. And then I mentioned scenario building um, in my own um, talk as, as a concrete example, which um, I do here at Sussex and um, one of the things that I think design also allows to bring into the classroom is the materiality of teaching. So kind of bringing in materials and allowing students to kind of maybe move, moving away a bit from the linearity of writing, which again is really helpful in terms of opening up creativity and um, um, developing imaginative um, capacities. Again, ambiguity is a really um, big concept that has been um, kind of um, explored by, by designers and is, is being taught within design contexts. And I think it's really important for our students to learn to become more comfortable with ambiguity, to realize that there are no easy or often indeed any answers to questions and to, to, to sit in this space and to, and to learn within this space of ambiguity. So these are just, I think, a couple of concrete ideas of um, how I see the value of design in critical creative teaching. Great, thanks, Anke. And, and Josie, that kind of brings to mind some of the innovations you were speaking about in, in your foundation programme. And, and there's a specific question here about how kind of dipping in would work in practice. So actually, what might that require us to think of differently if we have some of those deeper, longer time span partnerships, both with our communities, but also participants in higher education? Um, and, and whether you had any sort of specific thoughts on, on what it is that needs to change that will help us get to some of those futures? I think, in a way, my experience is that when students are studying full time, it can be quite an overwhelming experience and quite a stressful experience because of the amount of knowledge and the amount of assessment that they're having to deal with. And I, I think spreading that out over a longer period of time does give people more time to reflect and absorb and build on their learning. Um, I think some, someone I noticed in the Q&A, someone had a question about how that would work with professional qualifications like social work and so on. And I think in a way, a lot of a lot of those um, kind of qualifications 
they're already doing this. You know, people are already studying alongside work. They're already doing placements. Um, they're already developing apprenticeships and so on. So I think there's loads of good practice out there that that we can we can learn from. Um, and you know that 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 we don't have to sort of pluck this out of thin air. Um, in a sense that there's a lot of places that we're already already doing this. Yeah, that's that's it, isn't it? it? It's about how all of this this kind of fits and, and we're kind of learning from ourselves, isn't it? You know, this idea of considering our role and sort of challenging society, it, it's challenging ourselves as well, isn't it? Uh, in, in how we're really critical about this. And I'm thinking um, about, I mean, there are some sort of comments here about the sort of interplay between, between ourselves, between ourselves and society. And, and there's a, a question just come in, whether it's enough to simply make knowledge. And, and I think, you know, Julia, you've spoken very much about the role of the press in kind of fostering debate and, and connecting communities. I wonder if any of you have any further reflections on whether it's enough just to make knowledge. Uh, or actually whether we need to consider how we connect to wider communities. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would say that is fundamental um, and that making knowledge is for, for its own sake is, is not helpful to anybody. So, um, yeah, and hopefully it's come across in, in the, the talk that I did that, that that's you know, the essence of what what we try to do is uh, you know that translating research into being able to make a difference on the ground and and that's you know I'm sure the other um, everybody else would agree with me there because you know there if you're doing it in a teaching environment it's, it's the same principle really because the student, you're hoping that the students will take that out into into real life <laughs> beyond the ac ac academy. Well, except not wanting to be argumentative, Julia, I, I do think there are some tensions there. Um, and when we experience it as academics with the impact agenda, for example, we all want our work to have impact. But then it becomes like, well, what is it we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be kind of underwriting what governments and county councils want us to do. Is that, is that our job? That's not independent knowledge. And I, and I do think, and this is it's kind of where I differ a bit with Josie, some of your ideas, because even though I, you know, I think it's, Absolutely, mature students should be able to access higher education and people should be able to do it full time, part time. And in, an, in our study, we did really kind of acknowledge uh, some students, you know, that that sense of being on the conveyor belt and really thinking they should have had a break and then been able to come back. But sometimes I think the university has become almost too much like real life. You know, and I really found this during the pandemic as well as so many of my students, they worked in you know, they were, were worked in supermarkets, they worked to social, get, you know, they they bore no relationship to this kind of this idea of the student that was being blamed for partying, you know, but they were saying to me, well, I don't know who I am. Am I a student or am I a supermarket worker? You know, what, what role have I got? And I sort of think, you know, we, we do need to have that space where we can just pursue knowledge um, before we kind of work out how to make it happen. And also, I, I worry a bit that sometimes, you know, we're under pressure to make students into activists, which, again, I, I don't think that's right. I think if they want to be activists, they should do that themselves, you know, on the basis of what they've learned and thought, rather than it being something that we are trying to inculcate in them. So I think it is a very, you know, quite a difficult balance at the moment. I, add, I think that's so interesting, Jenny, and I, I really agree with a lot of what you're saying. And I, I do think as well that, that, you know, there needs to be a space within universities for knowledge for its own sake and, you know, for whatever the equivalent of blue skies research is in disciplines. I don't think all the knowledge that we're producing should be socially applied um, because, you know, you, the, the, I think that's just a really important function of universities. And I think in terms of research, um, having 
you know, some of my research is in this sort of co-production space. And I think there can be real tensions there in that um, sometimes you're working with community organisations and it almost feels like the research is getting in the way of what the community organisation actually wants to do. And the, 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 the research project is a way of bringing money into that community organisation. But Sometimes I feel like maybe we should just be giving them the money directly and not giving this the label of research, um, which is actually preventing anybody from doing what they really want to do. So, so I just wanted to totally agree with you that I think it is it is quite complicated and, and needs careful thought. That's almost perhaps a closing quote, I think. Regretful though I am to have to draw this to a close, I, I have an eye on the clock uh, and, and uh, it feels as though this, this debate could go on uh, for a long time. Is, is there anything on, on any of our speakers' minds, just as a kind of final comment or final reflection, something which you'd be wanting to say? Um, I quickly, I saw Stephen Mann posted something in the chat saying he was disappointed that there wasn't a scientist on the panel because he was wondering, and I think it's a really valid question, how some of the proposals could be a clip applicable to kind of natural sciences, engineering and medicine. And I, I, I totally agree. It's something I'm thinking about a lot. So please do get in touch if you want to explore how some of those ideas could be um, applied outside the social sciences, because I think it's a really important question. Absolutely. And that point about blue skies research, you know, there are some things which are fundamental and just exploratory or curiosity driven where, you know, the applications may not become manifest. So, yeah, trying to work out this some of this balance. Uh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so this has been a fantastic debate. Um, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers. Thank the audience uh, for your engagement, for your questions. So thank you, Josie. Thank you, Anka. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, for all of your thoughts, uh, for all of your proposals, provocations and, and kind of engagement with our debate here this afternoon. Thank you also to our organisers, so to Bristol University Press for hosting, for those people behind the scenes for making this all work so smoothly. That's all very much appreciated. And to our audience uh, for such fantastic questions and for such engagements. Uh, when uh, here in the UK, the, the kind of sun is down and uh, our evening is drawing in. So thank you all for a fantastic afternoon. I wish you a good evening and uh, hopefully you'll have something to take away and to reflect on as uh, we all build some of these futures that uh, I think we're all optimistic about, aren't we? Perhaps realistic and seeing the challenges, but kind of optimistic. And, and certainly I feel energized about some of these futures. So thank you very much to everyone uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>